Hello and welcome everyone to another InventRight webinar. My name is Andrew Krause. I'm over there on the left. I'm the guy without the glasses on the left. Um, Steve and Key, our other co-founder, is not with us tonight. But I have an amazing guest. We're going to have a lot of fun with this one, guys. We've been getting a lot of questions from our students and from our fans about LLCs. Steven and myself found Matt Horowitz's site. It's absolutely amazing. There's some incredible resources on it, and it's free. And he's just got a lot of great information on forming an LLC, so you can do it yourself. He has some other resources and things. So I just want to welcome you, Matt. Thank you so much for coming on, man. No, you're very welcome. Great to be here. Thank you. So you're you're like an expert at LLCs like I've never seen before. <laughs> Thank I mean, you I've never much. seen somebody so into LLCs and so understanding of every aspect in every state. How do, I was going to ask you at the beginning, like, how did you get into that? Well, it's uh, keep the short version of the story. So, yeah, I've been uh, teaching in the LLC industry for uh, we just actually crossed our 10 year anniversary, literally like a week or a few few weeks ago. Um, before that, I had a career in real estate. I used to sell and invest in real estate in Philadelphia. So as a very young uh, teenager, I decided, hey, I want to be an entrepreneur. And one of those uh, earlier parts of my journey was getting my real estate license. So I became, I went after my real estate license when I was 19, got licensed when I was 20 and began doing real estate transactions uh, at a young age because I ran into a bunch of investors and did a pretty decent volume of real estate transactions in my low 20s, uh, early 20s. So that was how I, and I formed, um, uh, it actually started one one day my roommate came home and he's like, hey, my dad and I formed an LLC for investing in real estate. And I was like, well, I want one of those. And then, so he helped me form my first LLC. I bought a rental property with an LLC when I was 21. So uh, that's kind of how it all started. Okay, I want to remind everybody that you can type your your questions into the questions box. You'll find that in the GoToWebinar control panel. And we'll either ask them on the fly during the next hour or we'll try to get to a whole bunch at the end. So as Matt's talking and thoughts are coming up, feel free to type those questions in as they come up. I also just want to let you guys know that anything shared tonight is just for educational purposes. Don't consider any of it legal advice. Seek the service of an attorney. If you need legal advice, this is not legal advice tonight. And that should allow us to talk about a lot of stuff, just that you know that. Um, so let's let's talk about the basics, Matt. Like what is, and I know we're going to jump on to your, your computer a little bit and share a few things here, but what's the, the basics of it? What is an LLC? And, and then also I want to know how it's, I think a lot of people go, well, how's that different than a corporation? Why would I want to do that? There's probably a lot to talk about there. Wow. Um. It's a great question. So I'm actually going, so an LLC, it stands for Limited Liability Company. Um, there's some two common language mistakes that we like to make a joke about is some people think it's a limited liability corporation. Uh, there's no such thing. That entity does not exist. It's a limited liability company. And a lot of other people say things like, oh, I LLC'd myself or I am an LLC. And those are those are incorrect. The LLC is a separate and distinct legal entity. It's different than you and I. We can create the LLC, we can form the LLC, we own the LLC, and we act on behalf of the LLC, but we are not the LLC. Going one level higher in terms of understanding sort of the legal aspect, you and I, in, in the eyes of the law, we're known as natural persons. LLCs and corporations and other business entities are known as legal persons. Uh, so that's a nice distinction to, to understand the difference. So we're natural persons, we form an LLC, it's a legal person, and that legal person goes out into the world and does things very similar to you and I, such as engage in business, open up bank accounts, make money, have expenses, uh, sue and be sued. Basically an LLC, a corporation, a legal entity can pretty much do almost anything that a natural regular human being can do except like you know do the laundry and vote in elections but they have a lot of power so it's the reason that people will invent or not excuse me the reason that people will create an llc is to uh, create a legal distinction a barrier or a wall between themselves and uh, and that of the business so that's what an llc is in a nutshell got it uh, you asked about llc versus corporation and <clears throat> Well, let's back up and speak about even a simpler one, such as an LLC versus a sole proprietorship. 
a sole proprietorship is just another way to say you doing business as your natural person with the outside world. So you engage in business activities with the aim of making a profit. You don't have to form an LLC or a corporation or anything. You can just do that in your own personal name. However, that makes all of the activities in the business, the assets and liabilities of the business, the same as you in your personal life and everything else that you do. So if you're a painter out there painting um, or, or basically any business engaged in business in, in, in any manner, if there's an issue or a lawsuit or any kind of liability, that issue falls on you personally. Whereas when you have a legal entity, a business entity such as an LLC, it falls upon the LLC and your personal assets are separate and protected from those of the business. So kind of like you guys say, hey, never sign a licensing agreement in your own name. We also say something similar, which is like, we never recommend a sole proprietorship. Like, it's just stupid. There's no, there's no reason, so, you know, LLCs are relatively affordable that, um, yeah, we can't, unless somebody well, literally let's, has let's like talk, no Let's money. talk about that. What, what's the range? Is California the highest? Well, you, uh, simplistically speaking, you have a fee to form the LLC and then the majority of states have some kind of annual fee or annual report, so an, an ongoing fee. California okay. is notoriously high for its annual fee, which is a minimum of $800. Um, but the fee to form an LLC in California is, is just $70. So also, if anybody listening is in California, there's a new law actually going into effect on January 1st, 2021. Uh, where LLCs formed after January 1st, 2021, do not pay the first year's uh, $800 annual report filing. It's not due until April 2022. Uh, that's going to, right now, as the law is written, that's going to exist until the end of 2023. So that's out of a lot of the economic relief and things that we're seeing from COVID. But besides that, L California is notoriously the, the most expensive state. So what's the cheapest? Uh, off the top of my head, I think it's Kentucky or there's a $40 state somewhere. I'm actually like jumping over to four. There's $20. some states where it's like 40 each year to maintain it. Yeah. Let me actually pull it up. I do have a lot of state fees memorized. If anybody is curious, if you just want to do a Google query, you can just type LLC annual fees or LLC filing fees, LLC university in the Google search and, uh, and you will. Yeah, you guys, it. you guys, if you, after you get off or whenever you feel like if you go to his site, if you go to Matt's site, he has every state listed and he has tutorials that are free for every state um, in the United States and it will give you the details there. It's it's amazing. So um, a bunch of people are typing in their states. What is it for mine? What is it for mine? So I think you'll go uh, to his site. We'll uh, give that to you in a little bit. Well, if uh, well, I don't know if you want to jump into the screen share. I mean, we can pull that yeah, up yeah, now. Sure. Or... Let's, let's do that. Uh, take me a second here. Sure. Um, you should have and then that'll segue problem. nicely into our into our next thing, which is what's the best state? Because people tend to state shop to try to save money, but that's actually not what we recommended, which is a little bit right. counterintuitive and not what people are, are used to hearing. Mm -hmm. So I think you should have visual. Yeah, we can see every, we can see your screen. Let's gotcha. See your Chrome. Let me go ahead and just minimize that. So I can just I'm just going to go up into the search bar here. Or actually, you know, it's easier. If, I'm on the home page here, and if you scroll down to the to the footer area, we have some really helpful information here. And on the left, on the excuse me, on the bottom right, I just clicked on LLC filing fees, and you can see them here. We have all of the states listed, and this is the LLC filing fee, and then we have the annual fee. Now, in some states, it's biannual fee or it's an annual franchise tax. The name is known as as different things. So, <clears throat> you know, on the cheap side, there are some states like Arkansas where it's you know forty five dollars. And like I said, California is 70 and then it's $800 uh, every year plus a $20 statement of information due every, due every two years. So a lot of people uh, look at this list and they're like, all right, what's the cheapest state here? They're like, oh my goodness, if somebody lives in Massachusetts, it's like, wow, it's $500 to form an LLC and $500 every single year. It's really expensive. So should somebody in Massachusetts or in California form their LLC in a state that's really cheap or a state that doesn't have an annual fee? Uh, the answer is no. This is one of the biggest myths in the industry that you should form an LLC in a cheap state or a popular state that people hear about, which may be Wyoming or Delaware or Nevada. And the truth is, most of the information that people hear about the benefits of forming an LLC, uh, they're not telling you the, the complete story. So, uh, Can I interrupt you there for a minute? Sure. What, 
Wait, aren't they doing it because they want to they want to do it in a state like I live in Nevada. There's no state tax. Beautiful thing. Right. But I live here. But do Correct. people want to do it in states where there's no state tax. They're trying to avoid taxes. What are what, what are the reasons question. why people... that doesn't apply whatsoever? Meaning a lot of people will say, oh, form an LLC in Delaware. There's no corporate taxes. Exactly. I hear that all the time. Yeah, yeah that's correct. There's no corporate taxes. But what they are actually referring to is C corporation tax status, which by default is not elected for LLCs, but an LLC may elect to be taxed as a C corporation. It's very rare. 99% of people do not want that type of taxation. Um, but that type of taxation would only apply to an LLC in Delaware if that LLC were federally taxed as a C corporation. So corporate taxes don't apply because that's C corporation taxes. And even if a state doesn't have personal income taxes, it doesn't matter. If you reside in California, you reside in Massachusetts, you pay, uh, your, you pay your state income tax in the state where you reside. So going out of state to get a tax benefit usually uh, never applies. It, uh, you know, for 99% of people, it's not relevant. They hear about fancy stuff that big, uh, big, you know, mega corporations do, but that really does not apply at all to small business owners, inventors, and things of that sort. So, yeah, for example, I, I if someone's people have been hearing forever, what is it usually that you hear? Nevada, yeah. Delaware. Was there another state or two, or there's no uh, state? Nevada, taxes? Delaware, Wyoming are the big three hyped up states. Uh, yeah. And there's also, you know, New Mexico pops up uh, every now and then. And, and there's some other ones for various reasons. But without getting too complex, there's all different types of jurisdictions uh, that apply. So in a legal matter, courts have different jurisdictions depending on the state. Um, but that's a little bit probably too detailed for this initial conversation. Sure. But let's use the example. We have an inventor in California who resides in California and is doing business in California, where they're like, I don't want to pay these fees, or I don't want to pay California taxes. I'm going to go form an LLC in Nevada, right? Or, well, let's just use Nevada. Well, Nevada, it's funny enough, Nevada is actually not as cheap as people think. <clears throat> you can see here it's $425 to form, $350 a year. But what happens is you have an LLC now formed in Nevada. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because you reside and do business in California, that Nevada LLC is now <clears throat> doing business in California. And that Nevada LLC actually needs to be registered as, well, as what is called a foreign LLC. Meaning that Nevada LLC only has authority to transact business in the state of Nevada. As soon as it begins to transact business in another state, that's known as a foreign state. So the states think of each other as foreign in this context. So this Nevada LLC now needs to file a foreign LLC registration in California. So now you're paying double the LLC fees. You have to maintain the Nevada LLC as well as its foreign qualification or foreign LLC filing in California. And get this, the, the, the Nevada foreign registration still ends up paying the all of the fees from the California Franchise Tax Board and any tax savings you think you get in Nevada because there's no personal state income taxes completely are null and void because they don't apply. Um, there's, it's, it's very, um, a lot of people make a lot of costly mistakes because a lot of people form their LLCs um, kind of in these hyped up states uh, and they're often misled. And then they may begin actually transacting business and doing business with that out of state LLC. And then a year later they realize like, oh crud, like I just did that all incorrectly. Now I need to like set up a new LLC, get a new bank account, get my direct deposits moved over oh, there. God. It's just a really, it's very stressful and aggravating. And it's oftentimes multiple times more expensive. Yeah, I saw, I think there's a warning on your homepage. I saw a, a link there that talks specifically about that. I think yeah. it was on the left side, little right there. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. This is a great article to, to read. It's called, What is the Best State to Form an LLC? And as I was mentioning to you uh, earlier before we started recording, what state should I form the LLC in? What is the best state? It's one of the most commonly asked questions in the LLC industry. And unfortunately, there's a lot of websites that really kind of get behind the bandwagon of these hyped up states. And they just tell you, oh, form your LLC in Delaware for such and such a reason, or Nevada or Wyoming or, or any state for that matter. But they don't really tell people about the laws of transacting business, how uh, personal income taxes work, and numerous other things that are often sort of, um, there's a lot of misinformation in the asset protection uh, world as well, where most of these things do not even apply at all. In fact, it's much more stressful, aggravating and expensive. And so this article, there's a video here that goes over it and it, it goes into much more detail about domestic LLCs versus foreign LLCs, 
the fines and penalties that actually exist in numerous states for a business that's illegally transacting business as they call it. So that Nevada LLC, if it's doing business in California or any state for that matter, it's illegally transacting business because it doesn't have authority from the state to do so. And many states impose fines and penalties, um, taxes are, and there's just a lot of details. This is quite a long article and um, yeah, anyway, I can ramble on there and you can see this page has an insane amount of comments here, you know, almost 400 plus comments, so lots of people. Anyway, this is the most confusing subject matter. So I think just your listeners just knowing, hey, spend a little bit of spend a little bit of time learning about why the LLC should be set up in the state. Basically, the LLC should be set up in the state where it is transacting business. And for the majority of people, Andrew, that state is the state in which they reside. Right. Right. So when you go to the home page, you, you have this pull down where people can look up their state. So that's my question. You've sure. got detailed instructions on how to file an LLC in every state. How is just kind of a general question, just so people, how different is it by state <laughs> besides the fees? Is it, sure. it's completely it's, different? It's very different. Um, and you're, you're speaking with somebody who's very, very detailed. Myself, our team, our research team, our, our, our educators and our teachers work extremely detailed. So we don't treat any other state like another because it tends to oversimplify information. For example, in California, a lot of people try to go out of state because they hear about these expensive fees. And what happens in California is you have the California Franchise Tax Board that actually imposes its annual fees. Whereas in many other states, the annual fees do not come from the tax agency or the tax revenue body or the Department of Revenue. It just comes from the Secretary of State. So the way that an LLC is treated state by state is very different. Um, so yes, anyone can navigate how to form an LLC in any single state by accessing this drop-down menu here, or we also just have them you know, listed here. So for example, if I open up California and uh, let's see here, Texas, and uh, what was the other one I was thinking about with California? Oh, New York, a very quirky state. So we, the word we use a lot internally is quirks. Every state has quirks. So, well, let's just back up a little bit. Once you click on any state, you're going to look at a summary page. So this is not super step-by-step. -step. It's a quick overview of, you know, just how to get some general information. What we actually recommend most people do is follow the detailed lessons. So the very first thing they're going to do is learn how to search their desired LLC name on the state website. So this lesson here is going to link out to the state website, teach you about the applicable LLC designators as allowed by state law. So like in California, you can only use these endings and in other states, you can use other designators. Um, and we show you how to search the name. There's a video here. We talk about a thing called distinguishability. Basically, the states will reject an LLC filing if the desired LLC name is the same as or deceptively similar to an existing business entity registered in that state, whether or not it's an LLC or a corporation. So if somebody has ABC Company Inc., you can't create ABC Company LLC. It, it misleads the public. So anyway, so every state's very different. Uh, after, after the name, once you find a name that you know is available, there's a thing called registered agent. Then we show you how to file the, the documents with the state in filing forms. Uh, we get into the operating agreement. I'm speeding up a little bit here. How to get the tax identification number from the IRS, how to file the statement of information. So here's a this statement of information in California. Apologies for anyone who's not in California. I feel like I'm just talking way too much about California, but in California, the statement of information is first due 90 days after the LLC is approved. Then it's due every two years, right? And in other states, like in Texas, they have a thing called franchise tax, where that's due every single year in May. But for most people who have uh, gross receipts in Texas under like 1.1 million and change, they don't pay any franchise tax, but they still have to file a report for that matter. And New York has a Bainey report. And in New York, you have to publish your ad, you have to publish your LLC's formation in a newspaper. And anyway, so every state is vastly, uh, vastly different. I'll, I'll pause or I can just ramble on forever about all the quirks among the states. Yeah, it's it's interesting. So you you mentioned to me, correct me if I'm wrong, you said 97% of, because you give detailed instructions on how people can file their own LLC without an attorney or a service on your site. And you said the vast majority of people that go on your site do that. 
And you have some links, I think, where people can use the service or something. But um, so do you think it's something the average person can do? I mean, if you're paying attention, just looking at the instructions. I know I, I did it in Nevada, and I, I didn't find it to be difficult. I, mean, I didn't have a great tutorial like this. I had to read through a bunch of government <laughs> documents. It wasn't it wasn't nearly organized like this. I think anybody who finds your website is really lucky. It makes it so much easier. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just going to jump into a, a random state. Or actually, let me ask, do you know kind of what state most people are in? I can just, I don't want to keep using the same state our, examples. I our, well, and we'll, well, you said we were going to address this a little bit too. Our our fans and our students are all over 50 states and all over the world, actually. We've, we've had students in over 65 countries. So there's no one state. We do have a, I don't know, for our students, actually more people on the East Coast than the West Coast. Some on the West Coast. So um, you could choose a West Coast, the East Coast company or something. I sure. So I just state. jumped Sorry. into Georgia. Basically, um, and we're, we're making some design changes recently, too. So if someone is ever watching this video in the future, you may find these detailed lessons listed on the left-hand side. But you can see here that the detailed lessons are laid out in the same fashion. So if we just kind of like the name search and the registered agent, there's not usually like a filing with the state that's made there. But if I just jump right into like, actually, how do you form an LLC in Georgia? Well, you file that with the document called Articles of Organization. That's the name in most states is Articles of Organization. Some states call it the Certificate of Organization and other states call it the Certificate of Formation. It's just a fancy word for a form that organizes or forms the LLC. Um, so here in the Georgia lesson, as I scroll down, you can see I can just download, uh, get access to that PDF right here. And in Georgia, you file the Articles of Organization uh, along with another document called the Transmittal Form. And those two forms together is what creates the LLC. So on this page here, it shows you uh, how to actually file the forms by paper, or you can go to eCorp, which is the online filing in Georgia. And you can see here, create a business, you know, click here, this drop down, select this drop down, choose this for your business name. Here's how you list your business purpose. This is what you can list for your how address. How do you keep all email. this up to date? Do you have a whole team of people that go into each one of these sites and make updates to this stuff? Uh, yes. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's more than a full-time job to manage all of the changes that take place all across the States with forms changing, laws changing, things like that. I mean, it's our wow. passion, it's our full-time job. So yes, uh, like we're not, like we're not kidding when we say detailed lessons. We used to, these are actually very nitty gritty details step by step. So for example, small little tips too, like, you know, here's the date. And well, what's that? It's called an LLC effective date. And if you click LLC effective date, we explain exactly what an effective date oh. is. And some little tips, like actually this is very timely because right now we're in November. So if somebody wants to form an LLC in November, October, November, December, but they don't actually need to really engage with business until the new year, you can actually form your LLC and file it with the state now, but you can use an LLC effective date of 1-1-2021. And while you file the documents now in October, November, December, that LLC isn't, doesn't go into existence, doesn't become effective, AKA it's not born until 2021. So for people in Texas, if you form a, an LLC in November, well, you now have to file your franchise tax report in May, 2021. Well, if you use an effective date of 1-1-2021, you just move that filing all the way up until May 15th, 2022. So uh -huh. every as you go through the instructions on our site, there we link out to any relevant piece of information, um, and it does go step by step uh, through uh, through that form. Can I ask you a big picture question? Sure. Why a lot of people say LLCs are easier? You know, why why do people like LLCs as opposed to corporations? Why are they so popular? Great question. Uh, an LLC has a lot of management flexibility to it. And I'm actually going to zip all the way down to our footer. And I am going to, let's see here, click on, I'm going to click on LLC. Oh, we have versus sole proprietorship. Anyway, if you just Google LLC versus corporation, LLC university, you can get here. And this is just some, some high level stuff, explain the differences between a corporation, a sole proprietorship and an LLC. Um, one of the biggest things is the flexibility of management um, with an LLC. So if you and I were to form an LLC, all we have to do is just list ourselves as the members. A member of an LLC is an owner. It's the same thing. They're synonyms. The technical name is a member. Um, 
and we can just do that jumping back over to jump around a tiny bit over here in Georgia if I click operating agreement and I scroll down to this download section and I click on the PDF we give out free operating agreements for every single state um, it, Andrew if you and I filled this out after we formed a Georgia LLC this makes you and I let's say 50 50 owners in this business that's it we can just well I'm oversimplifying it we can just kind of go off and be to the races and we can just engage in business activities on behalf of the LLC we can you know make money we can do anything we want we can sign licensing agreements etc on the other hand if we want to create a corporation you and I are shareholders uh, the filing is a little bit more complex because a corporation um, sort of uh, takes place um, engages with the outside world through its corporate officers um, so a corporation has three parties to it. It has the shareholders, the owners, it has the corporate officers, those people who have agency authority to act on behalf of the corporation. And then there's also a board of directors. Um, corporations also have to have annual, um, they have to have annual meetings. Uh, they, have to, they also have to file annual reports, but more so they have to have an, file an annual meeting and they usually have to document annual minutes. Um, and usually the taxation of a corporation is also uh, unfavorable for the vast majority of of entrepreneurs so they're more complex to set up um, and they really don't uh, I'm thinking about some history with them so they're more complex to set up and um, another example is double taxation uh, an LLC um, is is a pass-through taxation entity with uh, the IRS so the IRS um, this is for default taxation for an LLC. This is what the majority of people are going to interface with. The LLC itself doesn't pay federal taxes. The net income of the business is reported and paid for on our 1040, our personal tax return. In a C corporation uh, or a corporation, the corporation pays taxes on its profit. Right. And then you and I as the owners would take our dividends as they're called, and then we pay, our, then we pay taxes on the dividends at our personal tax rate. So typically the taxation is not favorable for most people and they are more complex. There's some very rare circumstances for more, much more complex businesses such as startups or companies that are looking to go public or raise venture capital. Um, again, it's probably less than 1% of, of people that are, that are reading our site and probably very few, um, probably nobody even on this call. So the LLC was actually, if you, well, corporations essentially came over from England uh, a long time ago. They've been around for hundreds of years, and their primary purpose was to protect the owners from liability. Well, the LLC kind of came into existence in the late 70s in the United States, and all throughout the 70s, 80s, and early 90s, every single state in the, uh, in the country passed a statute to allow for the LLC, and that has really spurred a lot of small business because an LLC, just like a corporation, has liability protection for the owners. However, the LLC has a flexible taxation status. So by default, the owners of an LLC, the LLC itself doesn't pay taxes. It just flows through to our personal tax return. Or we can actually override that and say, hey, you know what? I'm a more sophisticated business. I want my LLC to pay taxes as a S corporation or a C corporation. So literally an LLC can choose like four different types of taxation. And there's even other more uh, derivative, no, not derivative, more advanced um, Anyway, for people who are non-U.S. residents, there's another type of taxation that could also be applied. So the LLC kind of has the best of both worlds. Hmm, great. Can you go back to your website? Yeah, that was the operating agreement. Um, yeah, so, so all the forms, any form that, that anyone is going to need for any state is available to download. And there's step-by-step -step instructions, um, basically every single step along the way. So going back to your question, <laughs> coming off my tangent here. I'm quite by like if somebody just really has no interest, they just don't even care. They don't want to do this and they want to hire somebody like you can certainly hire any filing company. You can hire a lawyer. I, I love lawyers. It's, it, it's there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I personally am, am biased on just like I'm just a DIY kind of guy myself. Like I like to sometimes hire people or find really um, helpful information. But well, how am I going to say it here without sounding too biased? I think if somebody is interested in, if somebody was already going to do it themselves and they're looking just, you know, for instructions online, I think going through the process of forming your own LLC, understanding what a registered agent is, understanding the documents, understanding the operating yeah. agreement, I think it really helps operate your business because you'd be surprised how many people just hire someone to do something that they think is correct. And then they're on a, con they're on a phone call with their accountant, like, oh yeah, I like, you know, I LLC'd myself in Nevada or whatever. They they use the wrong word or the wrong verb. They just really don't understand what they have. So 
I'm a big proponent of kind of like learning, learning, and then therefore becoming a more competent and confident entrepreneur, because there's a lot of fancy things you can do with LLCs in terms of licensing agreements, uh, you know, selling or transferring intellectual property. There's definitely like, this is LLCs 101, but I mean, LLCs have far more, are very capable and you can do a lot of things with them. But if, if one really never understands what they're actually working with, whether it's, uh, it doesn't matter, uh, an LLC, a corporation, a sole proprietorship, or your licensing agreement or your product, and no matter what it is, I'm a big proponent in like learning, so. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. You're, you're our kind of people. I mean, even, even if you used a service to file it, going through your tutorial here for your state, you're gonna understand how to maintain it, how to pay the yearly fees. You just get an overview where I think some people, they hire somebody, and they're kind of clueless about it. And then they might pay a late fee because they didn't pay something on time. They might not be doing the right things. Um, you know, so besides paying the fees, what are the things that you need to do to maintain the LLC in most states? In most states, it is just an annual report filing. Now, just as a, as a warning here, we're not talking about taxation. Uh, federal taxes or or state taxes that does vary uh, among the states and there is more variability because the way that a state treats an llc depends on how many people own the llc it, it, it does follow patterns of the irs so this is a simplistic kind of uh, explanation because where the line of llc formation stops and post formation begins is a little bit gray because in many states, you file the annual report with the Secretary of State. But in California, besides the statement of information, your annual filings are actually tax filings due with the Franchise Tax Board, and you do have to file Form 568, which is a tax form, which we do uh, provide that information on our website, but we actually can't tell you how to fill out Form 568, excuse me, step by step, because it varies tremendously about where that, uh, how the business is, uh, earns its money, uh, where the business is located, uh, where the individual owners are located. There's a lot of different variations. So our website is very step-by-step -step in how to form an LLC, but it really cannot be step-by-step -step in how to file your taxes. Uh, with the state, um, well, taxes are often due at three levels. The primary level is federal, the secondary level is state, and sometimes there are taxes owed locally, such as you know Los Angeles County, or basically the, the city, the town, the borough, um, where you're engaged in business. So. After the LLC is formed, we highly recommend that people speak with an accountant or a few different accountants to just understand what they have to do on an annual basis from a tax perspective, if that makes sense. But in terms of the LLC itself, uh, on an ongoing basis for most states is going to be the annual report filing. And let's see if I can quickly find that as well. There's a thing called registered agent, which we should talk about a little bit because that also uh, creates a lot of confusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Well, here's the thing about the LLC industry, Andrew, in general. The terms are really confusing. They just, like, there's a lot of weird names. Like, you have this thing called registered agent, and um, without making it, I don't want to overwhelm people, too. There's a lot of terms that are just confusing, but really a registered agent is a person. Well, let me back up. Every Every state except New York and West Virginia require that an LLC have a registered agent on file. You can see what we say right here. Most companies trick you into hiring them as your registered agent because it sounds scary and fancy and like, oh, you need to hire somebody. But the truth is all the registered agent is, is somebody who is just on file with the state associated with your LLC. And that can be a person as long as they reside in the same state where the LLC is formed, or it can be a company, but you don't have to hire a company. If, you're, if you live in Montana and you want to form an LLC in Montana, you can be the registered agent for your Montana. LLC. Yeah, like for, for mine, it, it's in Nevada and I'm a registered agent and it's just registered at my home address and I'm good and I use my exactly. home address. Exactly. And you can certainly do that. So therefore, there's there's no fees. If, however, eh, so there is some, well, speaking about that, some people may not care about that. Uh, something that's important is the LLC filing and the details of the LLC filing do go on public record. So somebody may not have a business address or a home address that they are comfortable with providing to the state. So there are many registered agent companies that you can work with and you can actually use their address, not only as the registered agent address on your filing, but many times as the associated business address on the LLC filing if you'd like to keep your address uh, off of public records. I probably opened up too much of a can of worms there because there's more details to that, but 
nonetheless, if somebody is curious, you can go through our course, look at the articles of organization or certificate of formation or certificate of uh, organization in your state. You can fill it out following our instructions and you don't even have to follow it anywhere. You can just feel confident that you kind of know what needs to go in the form and then kind of adjust for there. So we do discuss all of that. The thing that I just mentioned about public records, I don't want to unpack too much of a tangent unless you want to get into it, but it's, eh, it's detailed. So a registered agent can actually serve as the registered agent, but in many states it can also offer some privacy if, if somebody is interested in that. But if someone really just wants to save money, you can just be your own registered agent. And most websites don't even tell you that. They just make it sound fancy. But literally an when agent- When I first opened my uh, Nevada LLC, I used a registered agent. Then I realized after two years, like, why am I doing that? I live in the state, just use my name and my home address. <laughs> Made no sense. Well, it's it's one of the reasons I'm really passionate about LLCs is like the terminology is confusing. So we try to go to extreme lengths to make it as simple as possible to understand and also provide things without bias. Like, you know, we don't want you to hire us or we're not going to say hire this company. We're going to tell most people, if you want to save money, most people, most filers are their own registered agent. You just have the option of hiring a company. Usually that costs anywhere from $100 to $300 per year. Um, Companies that we recommend tend to be around $100, $125 per year, but it's not required. But I mention that because if somebody does hire, they're more technically called a commercial registered agent. It's essentially a company who's a registered agent for you. So if you're hiring a registered agent company and they're $125 per year, you're going to pay that fee every year to that company to maintain that service with them, as well as filing your LLC and your report. And, so to answer don't, your question... Don't... Don't a lot of the, the companies that pitch the registered agent that you need to do that, those are the same ones that's saying you should file an LLC out of your state, like in, in Wyoming and Nevada or Delaware. They, they, they combine both those things and then you don't have an address there. And then they want you to be there. They want to be your registered agent where they can receive those important pieces of mail or whatever else. Um, isn't yeah. that kind of doesn't it all get kind of wrapped up into one? It does, it does. Uh, one thing I wanna add about registered agent is the real purpose of the registered agent is to receive what's called service of process. Um, if I just search the word process on this page, just so people can see it. Service of process is just a fancy word for legal correspondence or legal documents, such as a complaint, a summons, or a subpoena. Um, so uh, now some states, uh, in some states, the registered agent, well, the history, the legal history of the registered agent is to receive notice of a lawsuit served upon an entity. And that word for that notice is called service of process. Literally somebody giving you what's called process and process is just a document. So somebody serves that or service of process. In some states, the registered agent only exists to receive service of process. So in a lot of states, <laughs> there's literally very little mail, if any, ever sent to the registered agent, especially now with um, things progressing on the digital landscape, Many secretary of states, uh, many states, they just email people things. <laughs> so, however, in other states, the registered agent is used for service of process, as well as being sort of the main contact point that the secretary of state and other state agencies use to send mail. Um, but it does, it does depend on the state. But yes, to be honest, there are a lot of it's kind of sketchy companies, companies that we're not big fan of, fans of that tend to have service. You know, they have whatever service you need. You can hire them to file your LLC, you can hire them to be your registered agent, but you're right. There are a lot of sketchy companies that fall into the, the gray zone, we could kind of say, where they are very kind of misleading. Like, oh, you should just, you know, form your LLC in this state, just sit back and relax, we'll take care of everything. And they don't really take the time to explain that you, you can be your own registered agent, but you don't have to be. And hey, how does that apply if I have to register this, you know, Delaware LLC or Nevada LLC in my home state. So yeah, there's a lot of companies that keep things really vague and, and really do scare people into, well, into what are some of the other really what it is. LLC rabbit holes people go down? Are there any other common mistakes people make, things need to people folks need to be aware of? Um uh, yeah. So the one that we spoke about earlier, like where should the LLC be formed? Um the LLC should be formed, I'm just repeating what I said earlier in a, in a different way. The LLC should be formed in the state where it is transacting business. And for 99% of people, that state is the state in which they reside. Um, some people also say, oh, my business is online. I have an online business. I don't have an office. I don't have employees. Well, frankly, the states don't care. And that's not how the laws are written. If you have an online business, well, where are you running your online business from? Oh, typically your home office or maybe the coffee shop down the street. 
Well, therefore, you're engaged in trade. You're you're doing business, you're transacting business in that state, even if you don't have a, you don't have to have a storefront or employees. So again, just kind of reiterating that because so many people are really misled about the state. And let me just go, how are LLCs taxed? Uh, another thing that people misunderstand about the LLC is there is actually no class with the IRS called like LLC taxation. When LLCs came into existence, the IRS did not know how to treat them. So they were first treated like corporations for tax purposes, that is, not legal purposes. From a tax perspective, the LLC was traditionally treated as a corporation. Then the IRS changed the laws and they were treated as partnerships. Then the IRS said, fine, there's this thing called check the box. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a small section of uh, code in the Internal Revenue Code where they say you get to choose actually how you want the LLC to be taxed for federal tax purposes. So by default, a single member LLC is taxed, this is the key word here, like a sole proprietorship. A multi-member LLC with two or more members is taxed like a partnership. So Andrew, many people get confused because they form their LLC, they go on the IRS website to get their EIN, also known as their federal tax ID number, and they yeah. see things on there like your LLC, they read it so fast that they think it says your LLC is a sole proprietorship. And they're like, oh my goodness, that's the whole reason I formed this thing. I don't want to be a sole proprietorship. I want to, I want to form an LLC. And uh, you, you did form an LLC. It's just that the IRS treats single member LLCs like a sole proprietorship. So the way that the LLC, um, or excuse me, you as the owner file your taxes for your LLC is just in the same manner as a sole proprietorship, meaning you file a Schedule C or a Schedule E if you invest in real estate or a Schedule D for some fringe cases. But most people file a Schedule C and most people um, in a multi-member LLC files a 1065 partnership return. But that doesn't mean that they are a partnership or they are a sole proprietorship. So that's probably one of the other biggest misunderstandings is missing the keyword like a for tax purposes. Got it, good. Right, well, on um, expanding on the earlier comment, um, Jeremy says, what if you create an LLC in your home state and then move to another? Do you carry two LLCs? Are you going, if you're going to do business in your new state? So what do you do? You're in California, you move to Colorado. Um, what do you do? Uh, so the answer to that, I know, just want to cut. It's, it's really unfortunate um, that there is not an easy way to quote unquote move an LLC. Uh, it goes back to the way that the states are all, you know, they have different laws and the laws of transacting business. This depends on the state which you are exiting and the state on which you are moving into. Typically, there are three ways to move an LLC, um, none of which are that easy, unfortunately, and they all have different pros and cons. Um, I'll try to give the brief version here, but it is a little bit more kind of complex, and it would probably be helpful to see this in a, in a like a written fashion. But the the easiest way uh, is to, for example, if you have an LLC in California, you don't just have that LLC in California, but that LLC also has a, an EIN, a federal tax number, and at this point it has bank account, it has activities. It may have contracts with vendors, it may have licensing agreements, it may have things going on. So you could just dissolve or shut down that LLC in California well, excuse me, before you do that, you could form a new LLC in the state that you're moving to and then essentially transfer and assign any property, assets and liabilities of that LLC to the new state. And then that would allow you to just kind of have one LLC filing. So uh, another alternative to that is you can keep the LLC in the state where you are and file a foreign registration in the new state. That is the easiest because it's gonna retain the bank account. It's the same entity. It still is one LLC that one LLC just now has authority to transact business in two states, but you retain all the company history, the EIN, the bank account, everything. You don't really need to change that much. You're just filing a new sort of extension or registration in another state. The downside with that is you have to maintain two LLC filings. It's one LLC with two filings. So that means you need to have a registered agent in both states and maintain annual report filings. That was a more complex question. Than yeah, there's a third one I just <laughs> added in there too. Some states allow for what is called domestication. Domestication is uh, the easiest way to think about that is as a conversion. You can convert, let's say a Nevada LLC into a California LLC. However, conversions are much more complex in terms of properly documenting them 
And we strongly recommend if you want to do domestication to hire an attorney, because it's not just a simple form that is filed with the state. It's a, it's much more complex. So again, yeah. I apologize. I wish there was an easier way to move an LLC between states, but you either dissolve and form a new, do a foreign uh, registration, AKA foreign qualification, or you do domestication if both states allow for such. Wow, Jeremy, you got a pretty detailed answer there. I'm impressed. <laughs> um, so I wish got... there, was a, there was an easier way. It may be easiest to start with a foreign qualification, although it feels unpleasant because it's a little bit more expensive. It's the easiest way to keep the business wheels turning. And then in the future, you can look into a dissolution and forming a new LLC or domestication. But the foreign qualification is the easiest to keep the, you know, to keep the business activities turning. Got it. So I have a question from Elizabeth, and I know a lot of people are thinking about this because they've heard about having a corporation and having meetings, et cetera. So Elizabeth says, how important is the corporate book having meetings, et cetera? So can you tell us what's required with an LLC? Sure. Uh, there are actually no requirements for an LLC to keep a record book or keep meeting minutes, things of that sort. Those are kind nice. of uh, relics of the past. It's not to say that they don't, they're not unhelpful. They're not negative. There's no disadvantages to them uh, besides the time they take to do. What, if you think about it like this, uh, the record book and meeting minutes, it's like you hear those words and you're like, well, what the heck is that? It sounds kind of fancy. Literally think about it like this. Andrew, you and I have a meeting like, hey, do we want to uh, sign that new licensing agreement with, you know, ABC Inc.? Well, we can document the highlight the notes of our conversation in what are called meeting minutes. It's just a fancy word for notes, right? And we say, hey, in this meeting, the two members of such and such a company, we had a meeting and we discussed whether or not we're going to sign the license agreement. Uh, we decided to do it or to not do it. And we sign it. That's a meeting minute. And we take that and other documents related to our LLC and we stick them in a three ring binder. Now we have a corporate book. And now with digital, you know, that extends to like your, do you your need that? spreadsheets or your QuickBooks. You know, the books are just like the records that have to do with your LLC, but you don't have to have a fancy binder and a seal and record minutes. I mean, you, you certainly can if you want to. The reason that likely this question is being asked is a lot of websites don't really tell you that this is optional. It's not a requirement. They really just want to sell you a record book and make an extra $80 of you, which is the, the mm. uh, again, there's no disadvantages, but I just want people to know it's not a requirement um, and you do not have to do it as an LLC. There is no statutory requirement uh, to do such a thing. Good, good, okay. However, a corporation um, statutorily does have to adhere to those guidelines. Right, but even that's pretty easy to comply with. But we're talking yeah, it's about not, LLCs, it's not yeah. that complicated. But if someone's checking out or looking at different service providers and they have all these, to be honest, a lot of websites have a lot of upsells, right? If you not the companies that we recommend, which you can find on our website, um, but like um, many companies, you know, they tell you, oh, we'll form your LLC for really cheap or whatever it is, and then you begin the checkout flow. They start to upsell you all this stuff, and one of the most common upsells is like the corporate book. So you can get it if you want. Just want to let people know that like there's no, you're not, it's not, you're not going to be harmed. There's, uh, it's not bad if you don't want to do it. Most companies are literally just trying to sell you something extra that you usually don't need. Jeff, uh, Jeff has a question. Thank you, uh, Elizabeth, for that question. Jeff says, can you add people to the LLC after it's been formed? Great question. This is going, the answer is yes. The, the further answer is it's a little bit more complicated than people think on its face. Um, huh. <laughs> like I said, I know details. So at any time, an LLC can add or remove members. Uh, in some states, members are listed publicly in the articles of organization. So in those states, people think, oh, I just file what's called an amendment, right? A change. I file an amendment to my articles of organization and I add or remove a person. Okay, yeah. cool. You updated your filing with the state, but did you amend your operating agreement? Did you update the State Department of Revenue? Did you update the bank? And guess what? If you have one member and you go to two, or you have two or more members and you go down to one, you have now changed the LLC's federal tax classification and you have to file Form 8832 with the IRS to let them know about the change in classification to that LLC. Mm. So okay. I'll give you the quick, the, the high level is, yes, it can be done. However, if somebody is getting ready to form an LLC and they're kind of on the, the fence about whether or not they're going to have a business partner or they're not, 
I really recommend that you take more time to figure that out because adding or removing members while it can be done is often a stressful process and it's hard to find really step-by-step -step information because what should be formed is an assignment of LLC membership interest. If you're a 100% owner and you add another person, you own 100% interest in that company. You have to assign and transfer some number, whether it's 50 or 60 or one or 99. You have to transfer that via a document called an assignment of LLC membership interest. Then you need to amend your operating agreement. Then if the members are listed with the state, you file an amendment with the state. If they're not listed with the state, you don't file an amendment. Then you update the Department of Revenue. Then you add or remove that person to the bank account. Then you update the IRS if there is a change in class tax classification. So it's not easy. So think long and hard about whether it's gonna be just yourself or a partner, because while it can be done, it's really annoying, basically. Matt, you don't seem to know much about LLCs, man. You're just, <laughs> I'm just kidding, man. I'm messing with you. <laughs> you really know no, I know you were. Yeah, I, like I have to make sure I don't go to, uh, too detailed. I don't want you to be writing down all of those. You know, I'm trying to help you. Another related thing, let me throw in there. Same thing about the LLC name. Spend yeah, we got some questions about that. Can you talk about that? Sure. This is really related to like making changes. While you can make changes to an LLC, what happens is you kind of create this box, right? But as that box lives and grows and exists in the outside world, it does business and engages with different people, organizations, and state authorities and federal authorities. So as time goes on, if you make a change to the box, you have to update you know, the places that that box is doing business with and what federal and state and local agencies you know, have authority or jurisdiction over that box. So if you don't really know what you want your LLC name to be, or you don't feel like more than 80% confident in your name, a lot of people rush the process of forming the LLC uh, they file it, they call their LLC something that they don't like. I'm happy to chat about LLC names or just like branding or DBAs or fictitious names. If anybody has any questions, feel free to throw them in there because uh, I'm also passionate about naming in and of itself. But to get back to the other thing, if you name an LLC and then a bunch of time goes on and you want to change that LLC name, you can file an amendment with the state and you can change the name. But that old name still exists with the bank, with the IRS. Uh, and with the state taxing authority and anywhere else that LLC is engaging with and doing business, maybe if it has some checks, maybe it has a debit card, maybe it has a credit card. Well, I've done it myself. It's really annoying to change your LLC name across all of those places because it's not just, to, right? you don't just file one form. The form to file with the IRS is different. By the way, if, you, if you're on our website and you, know, you type LLC change name IRS, you know, we have a guide on everything. Um, if I can find it now, here it is, change LLC address how to change your LLC address with the IRS. You know, we show you how to do that, but it's a different form for the state. It's a different process with the bank. Um, so we recommend really spending some time learning about LLCs, whether or not you do it yourself, you hire somebody or, or anything, just kind of, you know, getting familiar ahead of time really does help or reading the, the name search lesson. But again, while you can change your LLC name later, later, it's a lot better to just spend a couple of days thinking about your LLC name, writing out all the different variations of it, you know, asking some friends and family members, um, and then feeling a lot more confident when you file it so that the chance that you want to change it later is lower. Hmm. Yeah, I really like your approach there. You need to get educated about it, um, even if you're going to pay somebody else to do that. I, it's nice to know what they're doing. And, you know, sometimes when it gets complicated, they can handle those details. But it sounds like a, a vast majority of the time people can just file their own LLC. But even if they're not going to, they should educate themselves. Next question is from Russ. When you convert a sole proprietorship into an LLC, do you need, need a new EIN employer identification number? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, that is a more complex answer, unfortunately. Um, so you can see we have a we actually have a page on have that to, here on the website. Know, that's, all, that's all we need to know. That's Oh, there you go. Oh, okay. Uh, so we do have two. Uh, so do I need a new EIN if I change from sole proprietorship to LLC? Uh, it depends on a few different things, um, but it is listed here. So I don't want to unpack it to make it too overwhelming. And then another uh, article I want to uh, talk about is convert sole proprietorship to LLC. Um, 
the word conversion, it, we just use it because it's what people really, really use, but you are actually not converting. You are really stopping your activities as a sole proprietorship, and then you are beginning new business activities under the roof or under the box um, of an LLC. However, there are some other things that you may need to keep in mind when switching over is a better word. You're switching over, not really converting. Um, and um, these two articles will really help um, talk about things to do with the bank account and different things like that, because there usually are business activities that exist with the sole proprietorship. Mm -hmm. This next question is really good. Eric says, does the LLC have to, does LLC, the, the letters, have to appear on your business cards, marketing materials, et cetera? I thought that was a good question. That's a very good question. These are great questions, by the way. Um, so let's just jump into a random state because typically, uh, while there is variations, let's just go to Alaska. Let's go to the name search lesson and I'm gonna search the word uh, designator. And uh, let's go back to you. Well, of course, we don't have it listed for Alaska. Let's go back to California. Some to, things to update in certain states, as you can see. We go back to California and we look at the uh, designators. So in the legal name of the LLC, um, in most states, you're going to have LLC, L.L.C. or limited liability company as the primary three designators. Some states allow for LTD or other kinds of variations. That has to exist in the in the legal name of the LLC in the filing with the state. Also, when that LLC is engaging in business activities, primary example, signing a licensing agreement, entering a lease, uh, any kind of legal document, you want to use the full legal name of the LLC. Whether or not the LLC needs to use the designator in its advertising and marketing materials, the answer is it depends and it is a gray zone. There isn't a black and white answer and different people have different schools of thought. Um, if you're in a sort of more, you know, higher risk, and it all comes down to notifying the public and putting the public on notice as to the entity, the legal person or the natural person on who they are engaged in business with. So, however, if you drive down the street and you look at any strip mall, you may see some places have LLC or Inc or PLLC for a doctor's office, but many businesses do not. However, many of those businesses do have registered what's called a, what's called a DBA, doing business as. It's also known as a fictitious name, an assumed name, or a trade name, depending on the state. So that's a filing that the LLC can make with the state or the county, depending on the state in which the LLC is formed, in which they can say, hey, my LLC is called ABC, you know, or the best inventor, LLC. Well, if you really want to do business as the best inventor and really just kind of have that everywhere facing the outside world, you really should file a DBA, a fictitious name, an assumed name, et cetera. However, you know, whether or not, you know, you don't need to have it, like most people don't have LLC in their logo on their website or on their, their business cards. And is that but okay? Some people do. The answer is there's really no clear answer. It really comes down to whether or not somebody is a little bit more conservative on certain legal issues uh, or, or whether, you know, there are some legal professionals that'll be like, absolutely, put LLC on everything. And then other people are a little bit more laid back. And they're like, you know, put it on things that are, you know, maybe a business card is a better idea. You know, should you have it on your logo on the website? It's really not that common. It's kind of um, messy looking from a branding standpoint. It does look pretty messy. Also, people think, oh, like, do I need to have LLC in my .com in my URL domain name? And, and no, you don't. That's just, that's different. But uh, I think a logo is okay, but like say, for example, let's say you're doing direct mail. Um, in that case, direct mail kind of falls more into the category of you should put the, if you don't put the LLC designator at, at the top, at the logo, you want to put it somewhere on that letter to let them know like, hey, this is an advertisement from this company so right. that they know that they're engaging with an LLC. Like if you're doing Typically, a mass email to 50,000 people at the very bottom, it says yeah, you want to have a company name or with LLC. Marketing materials, it depends on the type of marketing material, meaning I would say like logos and business cards, uh, you can, it's more kind of generally agreed upon, like it's, you don't have to have it there. Again, some people may just tell you to put it everywhere, but you know, you got to also kind of do what's practical. But advertising, legal documents, copyright footer notices on the website, any legal document that's signed, you want to have the full name. If you're not sure, you know, and you kind of want to have flexibility to do business under the full LLC name or the name without the LLC, we recommend filing a, a DBA or a fictitious name. And let's say you have a company called 
the greatest inventor LLC, but you want to do business under like um, Mr. Inventor, you can form a DBA that is owned by the LLC that is a completely unique and separate name than the LLC. It's really just a nickname that represents that LLC. So anyway, it's a, it's a long-winded question, um, but we'll leave it at that. Unfortunately, there isn't a, a, fast, uh, a fast black and white answer to that. This last one, I'm going to kind of answer and let Matt weigh in on it, if he has something to add to it. Vanessa says, do you have to have an LLC if you're going to license to an as-seen-on-TV company? So Vanessa, at InventRight, when we're coaching and guiding our students, we always tell them, you always want to do the licensing deal under an LLC or a corporation because it, it shields you. You don't want to do it under your own name. Um, and you don't want to do that for a couple of reasons. I mean, when you're licensing a product, if somebody, let's say it's a ladder invention, accessory, what have you, and you license that to an as seen on TV company or a hardware company, whoever, um, you're going to insist that you're covered under their product liability insurance. So any major manufacturer that sells at a retailer, they have a million or two million product liability insurance, and it doesn't cost them one cent more to add you to their product liability insurance. So that's your one form of coverage. Another form is they, the in consumers who want to sue this company because they got hurt with the product, they don't even know you exist as an inventor. Yeah, if there's a patent, maybe they could dig that up, but they're going to go for the company with the deep pockets. They're going to sue that company that sold them the product. Um, but just in case they go after you, you've got that product liability insurance, you've got the shielding and the fact that it's very rare that a company puts the inventor's name on the back of the package so they don't even know you exist. But then on top of that, you always want to do the deal under an LLC or a corporation um, because that offers an additional level of protection. So Matt, did you have anything to add to that? Because our, our students and fans, they're trying to license their products. So they're not starting a business to sell the product themselves, you know? Gotcha. Yeah. In a way, it's a very, you know, you could call it a mini business or a simple business. Uh, there's a lot of use cases for using LLCs to do things that are not yeah, I guess that earlier I'm used to just saying business activities and things like that, but really in the context of a licensing agreement, um, it, it's really just that, it's the royalty payment. So it's a simplistic business. If you think about it in a nutshell, it is a business. It just has less maybe moving parts or less activities to it, but it still is a business uh, just like one that has more activity to it. Going back to what we said earlier and we said, you know, LLC versus sole proprietorship. And we said, you know, we, we never recommend sole proprietorship. When you sign anything in your own personal name, it's the same thing as a sole proprietorship. It is a sole proprietorship, meaning in order to be a sole proprietor or like start a sole proprietorship, you literally do nothing but actually just start. Like if I'm like, hey, I want to go ahead and as long as I just start picking up the phone and doing things, I'm already engaging with the outside world as a sole proprietor. So when you sign a licensing agreement in your own name, it's you, the natural person engaged in that contractual relationship. If on the other hand, you form an LLC or a corporation, that contractual relationship is not between you and the company that you're licensing to. Technically, it's not you licensing. Technically, it's the LLC that is licensing the, the idea, the product, whatever it be, um, to the company. So, and I think another thing too, is it just, you know, LLCs, uh, in fact, any, any legal entity, any corporate structure just has an air of authority and, and professionalism to it. I mean, sure, it's fine. You can you know, and I'm not, I'm not in the inventing space, so maybe I'm not correct here. You know, maybe it's totally fine to just engage as yourself, but you might, you know, want to have a, a company called, I can't think of, an, if you have any examples of an inventing name. Anyway, just forming a company just kind of levels up the professionalism of the deal. And um, it also, it, it has that as a, has like a, I would say a, an additional advantage, but the primary advantage is liability protection. If anything happens with that agreement, you are not liable. It's the LLC that entered into that contract, entered into that agreement. So, you know, you really want to separate yourself um, just so, because by you signing that agreement in your own personal name, everything that's attached to you, your all the bank accounts you own, your home, your cars, unfortunately could be used in a worst case scenario. Uh, you know, if you had to go through the legal system, if you had to go through the courts. Whereas if you have an LLC in place, it, it's a hard stop. It stops there. The, L the only... Thing that can you know whatever assets it stops at the LLC they can't go after your personal assets so so if it's LLC if you're just receiving royalties there and then they're transferring those 
royalties to their personal bank account. I mean, if somebody did sue them and there wasn't any money in the LLC, can you just close up shop and go, that this entity doesn't exist anymore. I know you're not an attorney, but sure. how, do, how does that all, all I mean, work? Do people, that... are people delusional about how it really protects them um, mm. there? What, what's the truth? That's also an area that like vastly depends and one that's like, I have less to, to, to mention in this format, just because I, it's, it's a much longer, sort of more complex conversation. Yeah. Because sometimes a business may just be able to to fold up, uh, other times it it, it may not, um, because it depends on how. So we, let, let me actually relate it to that. So let's say a student signs a licensing agreement between them and the LLC. Well, then when that company says, "Hey, what's the uh, routing number and the bank account number for us to send the wire?" Don't give them your personal bank account. You right. want to you want to open up a bank account, a business checking account for your LLC. As Absolutely. soon as that money bypasses and never enters the LLC bank account, you've done what's called commingling of those assets. So right. if somebody enters a license agreement with an LLC, but is not properly taking care of the money, I'll, I'll talk more about that in a second, a court can deem your LLC an alter ego. And actually the, the, the person suing you, the plaintiff, may be actually, actually able to go after you personally. Now that's a big, like scary arms up in the air. I'm, I'm really oversimplifying it. But as long as you set up the LLC correctly and do not commingle funds, again, it's a fancy word, but it's really simple, uh, then the LLC offers protection to you. So again, that's kind of why I said it depends. Um, and that's just not one. There's many other things that it depends on. But so the way that you don't that the way that you don't commingle is you get all of the payments made to the LLC. They have to hit the LLC bank account first. Whether your LLC is a single member LLC or a multi member LLC, taxed in its default status, such as a single member taxed as a sole proprietorship or a multi member LLC taxed as a partnership, all you then have to do is, you know, old school, you just write yourself a check from the LLC bank account to your bank account. But right. now, you know, that can just be a mobile deposit. It could be a transfer between a PayPal business account paid to yourself. Or if your bank allows, you just log into your online bank account and you transfer whatever you want from the LLC to your personal account. And in those default classifications, people ask like, well, do I have to do that every month? Do I have to do that once a year? How does that matter for taxes? Frankly, the IRS doesn't care at all if you take money out of that bank account every single day or once per year. Whatever that LLC's net income is, you are responsible for paying those taxes. Um, I saw the screen scene. Screen. Yeah, change. I just Install. changed it. To okay. This cool. Sorry about that. So, um, so basically, you can take money out of the LLC bank account um, whenever you, whenever yeah. you need. They're just, they're just called draws. But the, the short answer is, it, it without a doubt offers you more liability protection than a sole proprietorship or a partnership. Like a hundred percent, a sole proprietorship offers no legal liability inherent in that structure. It's really not a structure. It's just you. Right. But it, but it doesn't mean it's bulletproof. It doesn't mean you can't do stupid things that jeopardize that. Yeah, if you people. commingle assets, if you commit fraud and a few other things, you know, the, there can be some personal, you, you can be on the hook personally. Right, right, right. Well, um, Matt, I'm so glad we found you um, when we did, because we get questions all the time about LLCs, because we're always telling people, you need to do an LLC or a corporation if you're going to do a deal with the company. If you haven't done it, that's okay. You can always do it in the midst of doing a deal, but you have to do it. And so people just ask us never ending questions about LLC. And I don't think there's anybody on the face of the planet more knowledgeable about them than you. And your website's amazing and it's all free. It's really, really cool. So when Steven and I found found you, I think we found you on YouTube. We were like, oh man, we gotta have this guy. We gotta have this guy on. So I just really want to thank you. It's it's nice to see somebody so passionate about a topic. You're very welcome. Yeah, I love it. I love I love teaching. I, I love the space. It always there's always more things um, to learn. And if anybody has any additional questions, you just you know llcuniversity.com is the website. Or we even recommend if you have a question about LLCs, you might not be able to find it. Just type whatever your question is in Google and just put LLC University in that search query, and uh, it's a good chance we have an article or a step by step guide on that. Wow. So, Matt, thank you so much for taking your time. LLC University, guys, definitely check it out. Click on your state. Take a look at what's required there. 
And if you're not doing it now, you write that down because you know you start Googling it, you may not find it. Because there's a bunch of sites out there, like Matt says, they're trying to sell you stuff you don't need. Um, so I, I really heavily recommend Matt's site. It's a really cool site, really cool guy. You could tell he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> I think of anything you come away with, it's like, well, all the stuff went over my head or I wasn't listening or I'm just tired. Well, just go back to lcuniversity.com, click on your state. It looks like he's going to guide you through it all. So um, thank you, Matt. Thank you very much for having me. Glad to help. All right, everybody. Take care. Keep inventing. And we'll catch up with you guys next time. Good night.